Thank you so much, man. I appreciate the path that you have taken or has taken you to bring you to the point to be able to bring information like this to the world. Thank you. It's very cool. Uh, what does it mean to align one's chakras? So um, this kind of goes back thousands and thousands of years that there is a the endocrine system, right, where we have all our glands, have more purpose than what we think is just tied to hormone secretion, right, and regulation within our bodies. They're mm -hmm. energy vortices. And the ancients understood this, and they knew this. And when you start to raise your awareness and consciousness, it's kind of like the first time you take psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Some people will notice like a flower of life structure on walls, or even in the sky or on objects when they take it, that looks kind of like a rainbow fl flower of life. And you're starting to see the structure because psilocybin doesn't give you an illusion. It reveals the illusion. So it's as if you're pulling up the curtain on this simulation game and being able to see the structure behind all things. Our, a way to look at our Kundalini life force, as well as our endocrine system and our chakras, is that as we raise our consciousness, in the beginning, we, we probably only have a few chakras that are really able to be fully activated and present. As you start to balance your chakras and start to transmute all of your past traumas and all of the, the things that you have chosen along your journey to be impediments along your journey so you can learn from them. We're here in a life simulation game so that we can learn through opposites. We learn through opposites. So if you decided on a menu before coming here to this earth plane in this third and fourth dimension that you wanted to learn forgiveness, then you would experience much of your life being done wrong. Yeah. Until you no longer judge being done wrong. That is the moment that you truly have learned to transcend the concept of forgiveness. You've learned it so deeply that you no longer judge its opposite. And that becomes such a critical aspect of what we do here. We, we choose on a menu of items in our higher self context what it is we wanted to learn and why we're here and what our life purpose is. So for a large part of the arc of our life, it's to remember who we are. And a large part of remembering who we are is being in touch with your own light body. And your light body is is inseparable from what we think of as the chakras. And aligning those chakras means achieving a rainbow body balance. So what do I mean by that? So some people can see just like when you take psilocybin and you can see different colors. Have you seen that before with like, uh, when you've, have you ever tried mushrooms? I'm actually on mushrooms right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Great>. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you probably notice that colors look different and sounds sound slightly different. Like music on mushrooms are, is great, right? Sure. I mean, I think everything on mushrooms is great. Um, but I could say that, you know, there's a there's a, a nuance, like you're more in the moment, you're more in the now, you're more attentive in a way, and your heart is also more open when you're on psilocybin. So, and... The thing I like about it, it's like I was never into pot. I've never really big in, been into pot. It never really did much for me. Psilocybin was something that I integrated much later in my spiritual journey. It's only been probably two years now mm -hmm. since I really integrated it in. But it's such a, I mean, the moment you do it, you're like, why doesn't everybody do this? It's like, it's just so heart opening. Yeah. And, and it's kind of crazy that it's even something that's illegal, right? Because the nice thing about psilocybin is, is you can kind of jump in and out. I mean, depending on how much dose you've taken, right? Um, you can literally jump in and out of it if you're micro dosing and still be completely active. Like I wouldn't even have known that you were on, you know, mushrooms right now, but I did like, a, I did like, yeah, I'm like quote unquote micro, but it did like a, between like a quarter and a third of a gram. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So one of the things that I noticed when I started going on mushrooms is I could see auras more clearly. Hmm. So I can see your aura right now, for example. I don't need to be on mushrooms anymore because my brain has learned how to see auras and I can still see it just as if I really wanted to focus on it, I could see the flower of life structure in this room without even being on mushrooms now. 
What do you see in my aura? I see it's very yellow and orange. Mm. And it's got kind of like a, a yellow orange. There's a line of blue and a faint line of green. So I can tell you that from that, probably the chakras that you have that are most strong in your life are going to be um, the probably the sacral chakra, uh, probably the solar plexus, which is which is kind of the yellow color. So you've got orangish yellow, some of those uh, lower ones, but then you've also got your pineal gland is quite open. Hmm. So your pineal gland is quite open, but the one that wasn't open that I you know would would sometimes see uh, you know more open was the heart, the heart chakra. Hmm. So that that could happen for any reason. You know sometimes the heart chakra is something that kind of might be closed because you've had some you know, recent issue or something, or it could be something that's a long-term held traumatic event that you've had that, you know, you, your heart was hurt. That could be any one of those things, or it might just be that you decided today, I'm not going to feel it as much, even though you're on mushrooms right now. And that usually has the effect of opening it up. And I've even seen it at a daytime where it'll just start opening up. And maybe by the end of the podcast, we'll see that as well. Yeah. But once you're in, in total balance, then the aura will be a balance of the rainbow, like literally a balance of the rainbow. And, and some people will have more white as well. Uh, some people will have, especially women will tend to be more of the higher chakras and men will be tend to be more of the lower chakras hmm. and, and both can have open and, and closed hearts too. It's, and it's, it really just depends on the circumstance of where they are in their lives at that time. But being able to align that so that all are in balance and all can be expressed Another one that is probably, um, you know, I saw the blue of, of your, it's more of an indigo color for your pineal gland, but one that also is a little bit, you know, not as bright as the others was the throat chakra. Mm. So throat chakra, and here I am diagnosing you right here through a, uh, through a you know, through a Zoom meeting. But, <laughs> but effectively, when you get all of those in balance, then your life starts to really gel. Yeah. And, and it can be the one day you can have it in balance and the next day it cannot be in as much balance. It could be any number of factors that can impact it. But the fact that you had both represented, so you had some colors from both the you know lower half of the chakras and you had some also from the upper, that's a good sign. That's a very good sign because usually it can often be the case that it's only one or the other. Hmm. I wonder what, what, from your perspective, we can learn from... Um, the Vitruvian man and Leonardo da Vinci and some of the um, geometry that has been ever present throughout history, mm -hmm. uh, how some of that applies to the mechanics of physical movement uh -huh. and how movement is informs or uh, perhaps supports access to different sorts of information. You know, I, I have a, a feeling that the body is somewhat of an antenna. I'm sure you've experienced oh, absolutely. This, various different iterations. Absolutely. Uh, how does movement inform our access to deeper wisdom within ourselves and within the world? You know, it's, it's really interesting you say that because, you know, it's tied to your former question as well. Um, if you're able to balance your chakras, then what you're really able to do is to get a good hemi-sync synchronization of the two lobes of your brain. The left brain, if you're right-handed, is going to be the seat of your rational thought. It's going to be where mathematics basically is generated from. It's also going to be the part of your brain. It's your rate limiter that says stop partying, right? It's also the side that's going to be all of your analysis, analytical stuff, and your material sciences will be in that side. On the other side of your brain is where music is. Mm -hmm. So in the exact same place where mathematics is processed, which is the left temporal lobe, is the music process center, which is the right temporal lobe. So it's interesting. So then you could say through mirror neurons in a way that music is, is literally, uh, you know, related directly to mathematics as a mirror reflection of sorts. Yeah. And that maybe mathematics is just the abstract form of music. Yeah, and in the center of the brain, paper. yeah. And in the yeah. center of the brain would actually be geometry, which is the music that we experience with our eyes. And, and it's right around our pineal gland. That's why people love geometry, because it's actually activating this electrical canopy called the thalamus, 
around and the corpus callosum around your pineal and pituitary glands. So our brains are not hard drive storage units. Our brains are antenna, to your point. Mm -hmm. Our brains and our entire body of light, which is that kundalini system, they're both antennas together, meant to be balanced. And the most important thing, I mean, you're an athlete. And if I were a runner, and I used to be a long distance runner, a mid distance runner, and if you are only going to exercise one part of your body and the other side of your body is not so exercised, then one side could become atrophied and the other side could become hypertrophied, right? It's like it becomes too strong, like a guy with one really strong muscle on one side and then the other side is very weak. That wouldn't make for a great athlete because a great athlete has to be in balance. And what the Vitruvian man really represents is achieving that balance. It's not only balance from the standpoint of stationary presence, it's also being able to achieve balance with movement. So when we look at Vitruvian man, you've got this man who's standing inside of this box, effectively. He's inside this square. And why did da Vinci choose the square he chose? And why did he choose the circle he chose? Why is the proportion of the two so you know seemingly deliberate? Well, normally people thought that that was a representation of squaring the circle. And how do you square a circle? You square a circle by matching the area of a circle and then drawing a square that would have the exact same area as the circle. Now, it sounds easy. It's not easy at all because the rule is you have to do it without any measurements. So how would you do that? You can measure it after you finish drawing it, but you can't measure it while you're drawing it. So when you adhere to the Greek rules of construction and you went to, you went to Greece very recently, right, with some of our mutual friends. I think you guys also went to Delos, didn't you? Did you go back to Delos? We did. Yeah. Yes. Delos, Delphi. Now, Delos is a very special place that relates directly to the Vitruvian man. You may not know this story, but the there's a thing called the Cube of Delos, which is in the center of the Temple to Apollo. Okay? It's on Delphi. Yeah. Now, the story goes like this. You have, this is about the 4th century B.C., Plato is living in this time, and there's a big problem because they've had a big COVID-like plague, okay? But it was a very serious plague, and lots of people had died from it, and it was going on and on for eight years and not going away. So people are like getting like a little bit at their wits end, and so they decide, look, let's have a meeting in the Senate about this. So they end up having a Senate meeting, and the conclusion from the Senate meeting is, okay, Plato, you need to go talk to the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi hopefully will have an answer for us to how to get this plague out from underneath us, right? So we've got to get rid of this thing. So Plato goes to the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi tells him, in order to be rid of this plague, you must double the cube that's the altar to the Temple of Apollo. So the Greek mathematicians are like, oh, what the hell do we do? How do we double a cube? Because they don't use any measurement. The reason they don't use measurement is because God in his construction of the universe didn't use measurement, the grand architect of it all. God didn't have a ruler, right? He had a straight edge and a compass. That's it. So the Greek mathematician was like, how can we double the cube? How much do I have to extend the side of a cube in order to have it be perfectly doubled in its volume? That's a conundrum. And so the answer to that is, how could you go from, say, you know, the number one to the number two in volume? And the way you would do that through the third power would be 1.26. So the cubed root of two is the answer. 1.26 to the third power takes one to two because 1.26 times 1.26 times 1.26 equals two. Now, this is also a metaphor for music because in music, we have something called the major third. And the major third represents when we listen to it, we love it. It goes... Da, da, and then we want to complete it and say, da, 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 and then da, so then we got the full octave, da, 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 so the very first second note that comes after that, da, da, is a major third, and when people listen to it, they say, that sounds like love, it sounds like love. It's interesting because when you do its opposite, inverse, people report that it sounds like heartbreak. Music entrains emotion. We use music in movies to set the stage for feeling. 
You know, Darth Vader comes in, it's dun, 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 and that scares everybody, right? Because this is something called a tritone. It's the diminished fifth. And these sounds of music actually can entrain our emotional states. But actually, that emotional state, if the opposite of the major third is the minor sixth, which changes its polarity, then what that says is that within the seed or within the experience of romantic love is the seed of heartbreak also. This is duality in and of itself, separating things into music, and you can separate that into light also. And it's all just based on mathematical interval, mathematical ratio. So what they had to figure out was how to double this cube. And if they double the cube, the plague was going to go away. Problem is, is that we have this problem today in music because music's major third is incorrect. The major third in music is only 1.25, which is a five over four relationship. It needs to go to 1.26, and then is, you can have it perfected. What does doubling the cube actually objectively translate to in, in, as far as physical action? Taking you into your next octave of evolution. Mm. So but, mankind going to, you know, from Homo erectus <clears throat> to Homo sapien, and the next step is Homo luminous or Homo sanctus luminous, right? So sacred light. The next step of humanity, you've probably heard of 12-strand DNA. 12-strand DNA is considered to be an octave doubling for mankind or a volume doubling for mankind. That's why the Vitruvian man is inside this box. How do you double his octave of experience? And in order to double it perfectly, you can't use the 5 over 4 ratio. 5 over 4 would only go from 1 hertz to 1.95. It doesn't get you to the doubling. It has to double. Everything has to double. So when you were there at, you know, this uh, Temple of Apollo, and I remember when Vailana and Aubrey went like about a year and a half ago, and uh, before they went, they asked me, you know, they sent me a text message like, we were in, we're going to Delphi tomorrow. What should we do? And I said, please sing this music because it actually represents the doubling of the cube hmm. of humanity. And I was just with Matthias. We went to uh, Rome together. And we were visiting all we, we you know, it's funny. It's, it's like if you've ever spent a lot of time with Matthias, it's like. M Matthias de Stefano. Yeah, Matthias de Stefano. Yeah. It's, it's like a, every day is like a scavenger hunt, right? Every day is like a scavenger hunt. And yeah. we're going to go touch things and we're going to go say a prayer here. We're going to go do something there. We went to the Vatican together, which was pretty epic, right? And, and our, our whole goal was to turn Roma into Amor which is just Roma backwards. How would you describe Matthias Stefano for people who don't know who that is? You could just look him up. You know what's funny? Uh, the best way I could describe it is, first of all, he's a, he's a person who remembers his past lives. Mm -hmm. He remembers his past lives throughout time. And, and there are quite a few people that can remember their past lives, but his are unique because he remembers them in particular related to his time living in you know, a past civilization that many, you know, including him, refer to as Atlantis. Yeah. And so, so uh, but Matthias is, you know, it was funny, I was having breakfast with another mutual friend of ours, Justin Resvani, and, um, mm -hmm. and also Eric Weinstein, yep. who's kind of a, a, a physical, a physics, a mathematical physicist, who I, he and I have known each other for several years, but we'd never met in person. And we were in Miami together and Matthias joined us. So imagine a breakfast with a kind of a very, very academic thinking, mathematical physicist, myself, right, who kind of bridges both worlds. And then Matthias is sitting there and Justin, right? And so Eric Weinstein says to me, he says, which, uh, which government agency is Matthias with? And I said, oh, he's with G-O-D. And, and he's like, which agency is that? <laughs> it's so funny. I'm like, G-O-D. Okay. Um, you know, not DOD, but GOD. Uh, you know, Matthias is is one of these special people who uh, has a, has a role and mission in in what's happening in the global change that's moving us towards this doubling of octave and mm -hmm. new experience for humanity. You know, from Homo erectus transitioning to Homo sapien, and then Homo sapien transitioning now to uh, the Homo luminous or Homo sanctus luminous. And yeah. to me, it's a it's a very exciting time because we are starting to wake up from the illusion that we put ourselves to sleep in. 
Yeah. It's when the muggles are waking up and we were the muggles and we didn't know. So something that I am very curious about. So I was also reaching out to you. Um, I was in Egypt recently on a separate trip other than the Greece trip. Mm -hmm. I've thankfully been traveling a lot this year, it seems. Uh, But while I was in Egypt, um, I tried to do as much research as I could on what the freak the uh, pyramids are. Mm -hmm. And some of the potential descriptions is one, it's kind of like some form of energy center creator, like a Tesla coil, but mm-hmm. probably maybe slightly different in some way that you would understand mm-hmm. better than I would. Um, I've heard you mention it as like an ascension mechanism mm-hmm. or ascension device, which I'd love mm-hmm. to elaborate on what mm-hmm. that means. Uh, there's also the suggestion that they, they could be a tomb, but it doesn't seem like there's actually a ton of evidence that they are tombs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also the other aspect of it, of the potential that they're significantly older than what we suggest. Yeah. And who the heck made them? Was it extraterrestrials? Was it people? Were they made of concrete? You know, were they like, what the heck is going on with the pyramids in, uh, from your perception? You know, um, I believe, and I've just done a lot of work on this and I'm presenting at Gaia's, um, ancient civilizations conference in a few weeks. And I'm presenting on a new uh, research effort that we just undertook that we found a, me and my team found a linkage between all the pyramids in the world. Mm -hmm. They were all built on similar geometric principle. Now, not just that they were pyramid shaped. No, I'm I'm talking about something more specific than that. So for example, the pyramids on the Giza plateau, the great pyramid has a very specific angle in its slope. So its slope is 51.8539 seven degrees, right? I mean, it's it's just perfect like that. So 51.85397. Uh, and then the second pyramid, Khafre pyramid, or what we call G2. So often G1 is the name we give to the Great Pyramid and G2 is the name we give to Khafre. We've given other names to it from an Egyptological perspective uh, related to dynastic pharaohs, but I personally am not believing that those are the people who built it. So, but we call it Khafre anyway. Khafre pyramid is the second pyramid. And it has a slope angle of 53.13019 degrees. And then the third pyramid is called Menkare Pyramid. And, and the Great Pyramid is Khufu. And Khufu was the grandfather. Then Khafre is the son. And then the grandson is Menkare. That's the story. But it doesn't really hold water because why would the grandson, unless he squandered his fortune, build the smallest of the three pyramids, right? You'd, you'd think that he'd be like, oh, yeah. I'm going to build the bigger one and be better and, you know, show that our civilization has advanced even further. Well, actually, what you find with that third pyramid is that it has a slope angle of 51.34 degrees. And these are very, very deliberate angles of ascent, right? Extremely deliberate and, and they're measurable. So we have them measured by various people that have surveyed the, the pyramids, including uh, Petrie, Flinders Petrie, who's probably did the best job in the 19th century. But when you look at it, I figured out that this is actually just a simple grid. It's not so complex at all. It's a simple grid of the flower of life. And from the basic flower of life, which delineates the integer values of one. So you start with a circle with a radius one, and then another circle with radius one, another circle with radius, and you put them adjacent to each other until you build out this whole flower of life. And you do another flower of life rotated on its axis. So you got an X axis and a Y axis flower of life, which would then give you 12 points like a clock in the outer uh, circumference of this. Specifically within Giza. Yes. So what I found first and foremost was that the Great Pyramid is two over pi. So its height ratio wise would be two and its base is pi. And if you do that, you get exactly the 51.85397 degree angle. So then the next pyramid, Khafre Pyramid, is related to that system. Now, when I say two over pi, pi, because pi is the circumference of a circle with a diameter of one. Does that make sense? So a circle with diameter one will have a circumference of pi. So it's another way of expressing two over one, and that's what the Great Pyramid is. So then four over three is the Khafre Pyramid. Four over three is perfect, and it gives you the 53.13019 degree angle. 
And then five over four is Menkari pyramid. So wait, so I've got five over four, four over three, and two over pi. Does that sound like a pattern to you? Because it's really five over four, four over three, and two over one. It's like five, four, three, two, one. Hmm. Right? Now, no one had ever discovered this before. And why would they do it? Why did they do it? Well, these are actually musical intervals. I'm a musician as well. And the musical intervals are very important musical intervals. They're the most important of musical intervals. The five over four is the major third, which represents romantic love Hmm. and divine love. The four over three of the Caffrey Pyramid represents stability. It's called a perfect fourth in music. So if you know the middle C, it would be going to F, right? And then its inverse is going to be the perfect fifth, which is that next note that I did. Da, da, da. It's the da. That's the perfect fifth. So then you've got the Great Pyramid at two over pi, and that's giving us diminish, the, the diminished fifth in the tritone as well. And in all the proportions, all you have to do is take the height divided by one half the base. And that gives you the proportion that can be converted then into musical notes using 432 hertz as its basis. It's playing a song. Hmm. It's music. Hmm. And I then extended this to see if it worked in Dashur, which you may have gone to where the Bent Pyramid is. Uh, The Bent Pyramid and also the Red Pyramid which are, you know, about an hour or so outside of Giza. And I started looking at all the other pyramids that are of large block constructions. So they have two kinds of pyramids in Egypt, small block construction, which look like bricks, mud bricks, and then like the step pyramid in Saqqara, or you have these large brick or large block constructions that, you know, some of these blocks could be a hundred tons, for example. And I looked at the very large block constructions and every one of them, complied with this exact same integer grid pattern. Hmm. So 14 over 10 was the, uh, the, the slope of the, of the bent pyramid up to its bend, which is supposed to be an accident. You know, they, they thought it was going to collapse on itself, so they changed it. No, they didn't change it. This was deliberate. And then we have 4 over 7 related to its, um, you know, to the, the part where it slopes, and that's the, that's the hypotenuse over the base. Every one of the pyramids in Egypt that are large black constructions all comply perfectly with this integer grid pattern. And I just discovered this. I'm presenting it at uh, this conference for Gaia in a few weeks. And then I took the analysis to look at Mexico. I wanted to see if the Mexican pyramids follow the same construction. Are they following the exact same construction? And sure enough, they are. They're perfect integer constructions that nobody really tagged. So it doesn't matter what unit of measurement that you use. It's the height divided by one half the base that matters. And that's forming a musical note. And if we know that the tuning standard is 432 hertz, we can actually sing that note or play it on a piano Hmm. for each pyramid. So this tells me that it's almost as if all the pyramids around the world are part of a gigantic musical instrument. Hmm. And that is evidentiary. Right now, it could be that a secondary value of the pyramids was that it was uh, generating energy. Okay, that's possible. I'm not saying that that's impossible. I believe that its primary function is spiritual ascension. And I believe as we study these and start to understand it, that this is the encryption that was left behind. Have you seen this television show on uh, Apple Plus called Foundation? Nope. It's a very fascinating show of a civilization that's like far, far away in a galaxy far, far away uh, that was lost about 12,000 years ago. And they were going through a cycle where their time was showing that they were going to fall apart and devolve as society and the 10,000 some odd planets that were had life on them, or maybe it was in a larger number. But there was a mathematician who was like a spiritual mathematician who went to the government and said, hey, guys, we got a problem here. Uh, we're going into the next cycle and it's like Kali Yuga. We're going into the darkness and we're all going to die. And all of the civilization that we've been building up for you know a long, long time is going to be destroyed. So we need to find a way to encrypt it all and compress all the data into some geometric form so that when our progeny wakes up from this long slum- slumber of you know loose, 
losing our higher frequency thought because the galaxy is going through this lower change, right? Then they'll be able to wake up and be able to decipher it and be able to have a head start when they start coming back into their golden age again. Mm -hmm. So they put all of it into this exact shape in the show. And this is a cube octahedron. They compressed all their information into one little device that looked exactly like this hmm. through compression of data. It's a fascinating show. I believe that's exactly what happened with the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid, the other pyramids are compressions of data and information for us to wake up with. Hmm. Would the suggestion be then, because of the, the placement of the pyramids, it appears as though there was some type of 30,000 foot view looking down uh, on the location as far as like Oh, a, without a doubt. I mean, the that's centrality true. of where it's in the landmass. And there's, 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 you know, a lot of things that you have a much better description of than I do. Another thing that I think is interesting that I'd love to hear your perception on as well as I'm sure you've, you've heard is it's a, uh, the pyramid represents like a downscaled si half size of of Earth. Is that right? If you take well, the, it's the, it's supposed the, to be forty three thousand two hundred times, uh, you know, to one scale. Yeah. So it seems it seems like some of this stuff, and I don't, you know, don't obviously don't not even like a shadow of an expert in any of this stuff. Just read some things and was there and was like, oh, this is really interesting. But it seems fairly evident in my limited perception of things that there was something someone, whatever, some whatever, kind of looking at holding the earth mm -hmm. to be able to create the structures. Mm -hmm. It seems like that would be the only thing that would plausibly make sense unless perhaps people or extraterrestrials or what have you from earth were able to metaphysically be able to perceive like the holding of the earth. But to be able to get those coordinates, however you know long ago they were actually created to be able to establish that, it seems like you'd have to have like an above, like a bird's eye view of things, which is very interesting. And not only a bird's eye view from a space perspective, but a yeah. time perspective also, because I'll give you another reason why this is so enigmatic. So the Great Pyramid has a latitude and longitude based geo coordinate, right? That is 29.9792458 degrees right north and then 31.1342 degrees east now that would be the latitude which is the north and the east is the longitude right now when the pyramids were built neither you know nobody knew what the latitude and longitude was going to be because it didn't exist on planet earth at that time hmm. how is it possible then that the speed of light is exactly the same as the latitude of the Great Pyramid, hmm. which is, and by the way, the name of the Great Pyramid is fire in the middle, which is synonymous with light. So the mean of light. Hmm. And I believe the real names for the Great Pyramid complex are the Mer, Ka, and Ba. So the original name of the Great Pyramid was Mer, and the second pyramid is Khafre today. I think that's why the Egyptians called it, because everyone kept calling it Ka, Ka. And then Ba is the Menkari Pyramid, Merkaba. Oh. Now, not only is it, now I could believe for a moment, okay, maybe it's improbable, but if it was completely random, could you end up, what are the chances that you're going to end up at exactly 29.9792458, which is the same as saying 299,792,458 meters per second. That's the speed of light. And you've got to get every one of those digits right, right? I mean, that's that's nine digits correct. It's, it seems like a pretty, if I asked you to throw out a number that I'm thinking, and you can do any number up to nine digits, the chances that you're going to nail my number are pretty small, right? It's, it's like really, really small exponentially. So what that means is that whoever built the pyramids must have had access to the future. Hmm. They knew that it was going to be built or that there would be off in the distant future, a latitude and longitude system that would match. Now, like I said, if it was only the latitude, then fine. Maybe it's coincidence, but now let's look at the longitude and see if there's anything special about it. The longitude is 31.1342. Well, it turns out when you put that into Google earth, it actually converts it to 31 degrees 
eight minutes and three seconds, right? 3.1 seconds. Turns out if you put into your calculator 31.831, right? Or 3.1831, and you take the reciprocal of that number, it turns out to be exactly pi. Hmm. So on one axis, the latitude is a speed of light, and on the other axis, it's pi? Hmm. Really? Seems a little improbable to me. So pi being, you know, one over pi is 0.31831. That is one over pi, exactly. So now, and if you take that and multiply it or divide it by 360 degrees, that so take 31, uh, you know, or 31.831 degrees divided by 360 degrees gives you 0.864. And now you've got a time axis because the number of seconds in one day is 86,400. So you've got the speed of light on one axis exactly down to one meter accuracy. And the other axis is exactly what we use for our time measurements and relational directly to pi and one over pi. Come on. Hmm. That's when you realize you're in a game. It's a game. Like a, simula like a simulation. A simulation. Hmm. How comp, well, I mean, what does a simulation mean to you? It's a self-generating uh, simulation that I like to refer to as a spiritual life simulation game that we constructed ourselves. We willingly went into, we love to play this game. We love to play this game. It's like what we, we all have kind of an obsession nowadays with like escape rooms and stuff. Have you ever done an escape room? No, but I'm familiar. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of like a big escape room, but that's the big paradox is that the only way you can escape it is by not seeing it as an escape room. The paradox is that it has to transform you within through a series of challenges in hero's journey tests. Hmm. And in this game, you will continue to experience the same things over and over and over again until you learn them fully. And by that, it means that you no longer judge negatively the opposite thing of the thing that you wanted to learn. Yeah. So there's a, uh, a post that I did on this called The Rules for Being Human. I'll just read them off. This was handed down from ancient Sanskrit. So this is very ancient, right? It's kind of like Bhagavad Gita type of stuff. Number one, you will receive a body. You may not like it or not, but it will be yours for the entire period and round this cycle. Two, you will learn lessons. You are enrolled in a full-time informal school called life. Each day in this school, you will have the opportunity to learn lessons. You may like the lessons or think them entirely irrelevant or stupid. <laughs> Number three, and that's the whole point. You're supposed to forget all of this. You don't know this when you come here. And that's the whole point. You come in this game, you're trying to remember it. Yeah, that's the adventure. There'd be no adventure if, if you exactly. are. Exactly. Number three, there are no mistakes, only lessons. Growth is a process of trial and error. Experimentation. The failed experiments are as much a part of the process as the experiment that ultimately works and rewards. Number four, a lesson is repeated until it is learned. A lesson will be presented to you in various forms until you have learned it. Then you can go on to the next lesson. Yep. So if you keep experiencing the same cycle, same experience in relationships, the same experience in career and job, right? There's probably a reason because there's something that you net yet still need to learn and integrate mm -hmm. fully. Mm -hmm. Number five, learning lessons does not end. It never ends. There is no part of life that does not contain its lessons. If you are alive, there are lessons to yet be learned. Six, there is no better place than here. And now. When you're there, quote unquote, has become here, you will simply obtain another there that will, again, look better than here. Seven, others are merely mirrors of you. You cannot love or hate something about another person unless it reflects to you something that you love or hate about yourself. That's why family can be challenging. So that means if you spot it in someone, you got it. Mm -hmm. If you want to call out someone for what they do and their bad behavior, usually it's like I used to work with people that used to complain about so-and-so being so arrogant. 
And then I started thinking, well, the guy that they're calling out is arrogant. It's not really arrogant. The most arrogant people that I've seen around here might be the guy who said it. What you like, make? It seems like compassion is kind of like the shotgun approach. Like you can you can be a dummy and just lean on compassion, and yep. you kind of sort out a lot of this math stuff, and it just very math true just for you. Very true. But you also still have to learn how to balance your brain. Now, so let's say that I like physics and I only like physics. My brain is going to be more challenging for me to balance than if I liked a broad range of things. It's just like working out one part of your muscle and not working out, you know, it's like working out your bicep, but not your triceps. It doesn't really work, right? You, you have to kind of do it in balance. Otherwise it's off. So if you want to get a balanced brain, you have to study an equal part of geometry, an equal part of art, an equal part of music, an equal part of mathematics, an equal part of astronomy, an equal part of the physical sciences. Could you uh, just passively be studying geometry by doing something like being an athlete? Like if you're a quarterback, you're, you're a, a genius with geometry, but you don't necessarily have the, the numbers to apply to it. But you're a lot better with geometry than probably a lot of mathematicians. You're probably at an unconscious level, you're probably right, but not necessarily at the conscious level, right? At the conscious level, you know, you probably want to be able to understand those principles because those principles have value to you. They definitely bring value because, you know, I, I look at it like this. So philosophy in its applied form is mathematics. Hmm. Applied mathematics is geometry. Applied geometry is biology right? Or rather applied geometry is physics. Applied physics is, uh, is chemistry. Applied chemistry is biology. Applied biology is psychology. Applied psychology is sociology. And applied sociology is back to philosophy and applied philosophy is back to mathematics. So it goes through this whole loop. So there is no such thing as separation, right? It's like yeah. math and physics is just a language. It's like the computer code underlying the simulation that the architect or God figure made for us to experience this life. And ultimately, yeah. why are we here? I believe we're here to remember who we are and to learn how to love and how to be loved. Hmm. I interrupted your, the rules of life. I yeah. So the rules of life to finish the rules of life, yeah. <laughs> we can't, we can't leave that. People would be like, no, what are the last two? <laughs> That's right. There's two more. Yeah. What you make of your life is up to you. You have all the tools and resources that you need. And what you will do with them is up to you entirely. The choice is yours. The answers lie inside you. This is number nine. The answers to life's questions lie inside you. All you need to do is to listen and trust. I think this is a really good way of looking at life. And once you realize that, you know, it's like all the things that you still get triggered by are the things that still need to yet be transmuted. Yeah. There's a resonance within you. Yeah. If you, if you don't like what you're experiencing in your outer world, then stop and say, wait a minute, am I still judging this thing? Am I still judging this thing? Because if I am, it's going to continue to show up everywhere in my field. Yeah, if you don't if you don't like it, love it. Yeah, very well said. I like that. If you don't like it, love it. <laughs> here, here we go. I love that. It's like <laughs> what people think often is that we're in this game and we're here to transcend or get out of this earth, you know, simulation game or whatever. And and we have to fight against all the bad. We have to fight against all the things in the world that are just injustices, etc. All that will happen the more we fight against things is we will get more pushback and more fight back. And the number of people that are suffering from the things that we're judging will increase exponentially until we finally learn to let it go. And once we finally learn to let it go, then we can start to find peace. And this is where you go into the next stage of the hero's journey. And this is what it means to double the cube. Yeah, that's, that's, I feel like that's like, um, righteousness and holiness is that which creates its opposite. Very well said. No, that's very profound. Righteousness and holiness. It's like, I think what you mean is like this pious nature, mm -hmm. righteousness or self-righteousness. 
Yeah. Creates it fuel, the unholiness. It, it, fuel, it fuels kink. It's kind of convenient if you're into kink. But it, it fuels like all the muddy kind of underworld stuff. Yeah. And so if, the if best way to that, handle. If it weren't for the judgment, there'd be, it'd just be like, oh, it's just ease. There's just release. But the judgment creates the tension. It creates the fuel to fuel the metaphoric and literal kink. See, I think that's a very, very ascended view on what we're experiencing because I totally, completely agree with what you just said. And I just wrote this down. I haven't posted it yet, but I was going to. Judgment is the source of all suffering. Acceptance is the source of freedom. And love is the source of bliss. Here we come into this world where we are sort of forced to define truth because there's only so much limited time. Everything is scarce. We need to understand what's the truth. And the thing is, is that <laughs> what you start to realize, you know, when I was a kid, I used to think everything was black and white and my parents were not very smart because they couldn't make good decisions on stuff that was obvious on how to make the decision. It was black and white. But then as I got older, I started realizing my parents became more and more genius every year. Like their IQ was going up. Not that it was really going up, but maybe my perception of their IQ was going up. And then I started realizing that a lot of the stuff that I thought previously was black or white was really some shade of gray or maybe a full spectrum of rainbow of light. Yeah. Nuance. Nuance starts to come into, into picture. And that's when I started to realize as well that what I thought I was accumulating as facts and building up my database of my hard drive of my brain to make better decisions in life, I realized that the facts were no longer facts, but rather facets. Prisms. We have a prism of truth that would be the whole truth. And the only way to construct that prism of truth would be to accumulate every single possible subjective perspective of that truth. And that's what I believe God does in this universe with our eyes. It is collecting every bit of data from our unique perspectives, because the only way you could see something differently is from a different arrangement of conditioning biases, is from a different life experience. So each one of us has never been made before and will never be made again. And each time we see something, we are the universe observing itself through our eyes. That has value in and of itself, and it's beautiful. But when we finally realize this, then we start to think, well, wait a minute, then why, if there's no such thing as maybe an entirely objective truth, because I thought this was the only right answer to things, because I start realizing maybe that the things that I'm experiencing in life or the things that I attracted were because I judged them. So people say to me all the time, well, what does that mean for, you know, things like really heinous stuff like pedophilia and what, whatnot? And I say, look, I have a hard time with that, to be honest, because I have really judged the hell out of pedophilia. But maybe I start looking at the world around me and saying, how have I contributed to now everything being dominated in the media about pedophilia? Maybe it's because I'm still harboring all kinds of judgment around it. Mm, you're like the propagator of pedophilia. I'm a like propagator a of it without, like I'm an part, unwilling part. propagator of pedophilia. It was like the things that I, so I started writing down, I'm like, now the things that happened in my life, I start saying, what did I do to create this? I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. I'm not blaming anybody else. What is it that I'm still harboring within me that I wanted to learn from still, that I still have to go through this whole samsara cycle of repetition again? Yeah, that's a, a question that I've a moral question that I've had, uh, and I'd be curious your perception. Does a, a pedophile deserve love and perhaps need love more than anyone? You know, this is a really, really it's a provocative question because I I had a similar conversation about this a few days ago. Man, I got like very different answers. <laughs> it was like they were like you know ranging from no, they should all be burned at the bottom, you know, go to the bottom of the depths of the ocean or something. Um, I believe that. Everyone deserves love. I, I follow Jesus on this one. I think that the number of times you are compelled to forgive is, as he said, seven times 70. And that was just a metaphor. I mean, that's 490 times. That's a lot of times to forgive someone for the same faults. I think that what you can do, though, is you can come to a place of acceptance. You don't have to accept necessarily the actual act itself. But 
accept that humanity exists in this form. And that if I try to totally rid the earth of all of its darkness, there will be no light. Mm -hmm. And I'll live a terrifying existence. Because if I try to be the champion, it's like the hero that can only define himself and his existence based on the existence of a villain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the villain's your, the other side of your own coin. That's right. You know, it's, it's from Batman Returns when Two-Face basically says, hope that you live long enough to defeat the villain, but not too long that you become the villain. And everybody who ever was a villain thought themselves a hero. In their own way of seeing the world. You have to be suspicious once you start finding yourself to be a hero, I think. Absolutely. And so what happens is, I, I often say this, you know, people say, it was, oh, oh the so-and-so is a villain or so-and-so is this. And, and I say, look, the people that I have been more concerned about are not the people that are integrated in their darkness, that they know they have a dark side and they're okay with the existence of that dark side because everybody does. Everybody is equally dark and everyone's equally light. It's hard for some people to hear. I truly believe that. That's why everyone has value. That's why I got invited to speak at uh, the Vatican a few weeks ago when I was there with, uh, with Matthias. And uh, I was speaking on polymathy. And some people were like freaking out, like, what are you doing? And I would joke and say, I'm here to speak about pedophilia or something. You know, it's like, but I, I went there because people asked me, like, where would you not speak? And my answer to that was, you know, what place would be so reprehensible that you would say, I'm not going to speak at that place? My answer to that is, where would you not listen? Who would you not listen to at all? Because if you have a trigger about listening to someone, that's one of the sure sign ways to realize that you're going to continue to experience a lifetime of what you perceived as that villain that you won't listen to. Until we can actually learn how to love and embrace the circumstance we're in, we're not going to escape Earth. The way you transcend Earth in this lower dimension is by falling in love with Earth just as it is. Yeah, that's a, an interesting... If I, I, hopefully, I'll be able to pull it from the files in my mind right now, but I've heard somebody, they're saying something like, in order to want to cultivate meaningful progress or change for the world you have to start coming from a place of loving the world yes it's a big deal to it's get that it's a big deal yeah. <laughs> it's you very difficult start with loving the world then naturally organically the geometry comes online and you make better decisions but if you start from a place and that's like i've, I've heard as well you know the most dangerous dictator is one that identifies as a victim if you're coming from that place of uh you know, just not loving the world. You know, so there's some there's some pain, and we're we're leading from the pain. You know, th the math on that might be a little squiggly. No, you're you nailed it. <laughs> you totally nailed it. Because I mean, if you think about it, it's like the people that have really done whacked out stuff in history have been people that refused to even integrate or see that they had a dark side at all, and that's where you get genocides. I'm, I'm not worried about people that are integrated in their darkness. I'm more concerned about people that are not at all aware of their darkness. And this yeah. goes back to Carl Jung, right? If we can integrate our darkness and realize that we have eyes in the front of our head, but that we don't have eyes in the back of our head, so we can't see all the things other people can see in us. We mm -hmm. think that, and this is what I would define as narcissism, two forms of narcissism. There's overt narcissism, and that would be people that are very outspoken, you know, it's kind of me, 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 me. And they have gotten to a very high degree of self-loathing. It's not self-love. Self-love would mean they love all of themselves. They actually love only a thin slither of themselves, what they think they're projecting to the outside world and would be seeing in a reflection back at them. Yeah, their insecurity but is seeking validation. Their insecurity is seeking validation. So all of the rest of them is what shows up in the world around them because they're in a you inverse of their own you know, thinking. And they feel, very, I, I, ironically, they feel very lonely. And they feel very, very lonely. Well, then you've also got a different kind of narcissism, which people sometimes refer to as empaths that go along with those narcissists. So the empath would say, oh, my narc this and my narc that. I've actually read that in lots of places. And, and 
they are what I would call inverted or covert narcissists. Hmm. We have just different forms of narcissism. In the Kybalion, it basically says in the section about polarity, it basically says that everything that exists as opposites are identical in nature, but differing in degree. So two opposite concepts, arrogance and humility, are identical in nature, but differing in degree. And this is why you can have people that become pious, self-righteous in their humility. Like I know people that say, I'm so humble, look at me. I'm the most humble person ever type of thing. And then they do kind of like repressed, whacked out stuff too. And this is why I think we've got a lot of this stuff that shows up in the clergy, et cetera, because there's so much repression going on and hatred of their dark aspect that they end up having it come out like a werewolf. Yeah. Yeah, that's the the, the, the odd. I was talking to someone recently about kink. That's why it's re- relevant in my mind. We're just having a conversation about that and and seeing the the... the psycho spiritual emotional developmental value and exploring that which you're that which you find disgusting that which you find unacceptable yeah it's really beautiful actually if you're if you're open to because you could do it like how you do anything is how you do everything 100%. so you're able to access and that, that's hence the same analogy of like mm-hmm. math is everywhere math is music math is art math is math and math, is math, biology. Is emo- math is math yeah. is emotion math mm-hmm. is biology math mm-hmm. is movement and it, it all is is integrated they're all integrated systems and so you can access different aspects within yourself you know through something like oh this creates tension in my body oh great there's there's something there for you you know and and kink would be one of those examples another example would be like being in an intimate relationship and just observing the, the various different contractions that might come up in you and you know, relationship to primary caregiver oh and yeah jealousy yeah. and fear and all of that it's like ah ha ha <laughs> that resistance if you choose, like the, there is your zone of proximal development, like there is your growth edge. But generally, we you know we seek uh, pleasure, you know, and that's I think that that gets like biblical as well, where it's like if you're <laughs> you know, if you go too deep into the pleasure sp- space, eventually it becomes its opposite. And then there's a union concept. I don't remember what the term is right now, but essentially it's like if you go too far into one extreme, you become your opposite. You yeah, that yeah, term that's, is? yeah. Every strength becomes your greatest weakness. Yeah. they do is extreme that yeah. happens all the time i've seen that in my entire career as well so you know in the masculine feminine principles you know what a man wants in a woman is entirely the opposite in many ways from what a woman wants in a man so my friends who've gotten divorced and i've been you know i've divorced a few times as well so i'm definitely uh, a student that continues to learn at this and drink from this well over and over again um It's interesting because you talk to a man, you say, why are you disappointed in your wife? What happened? And he would say, well, she completely changed from the woman I married. She's, she doesn't look the same. She doesn't act the same. She used to like football. She hates football now. Now she, she only wears her hair up in a bun. She doesn't have it down anymore. She doesn't try to look sexy, but she doesn't like sex anymore. She doesn't, you know, approach me anymore on any of this. And she just is completely changed. She's not the same person I entered a contract with. So then you ask the woman, oh, what happened with your husband? That that fucker never grew up. Mm -hmm. He never grew up. He never actually stepped up. He never evolved. He never changed. He was still on the couch playing video games. And I thought for sure that he was going to evolve over time. So the woman entered the contract thinking the man was going to change. And the man entered the contract thinking the woman would never change. (laughs) That's good. And yet we fall into this over and over again. And it's because men are looking for love that they didn't get because they were constantly presented with conditional love for right or wrong from their mothers and from the women in their lives. And then women are looking for safety. And there's nothing wrong with that. A woman's love cannot blossom without a safe environment. Say that to any woman. And for the most part, she's going to say, yeah. That's pretty much right on. And yet, I didn't learn that until I was 52. Something's wrong with our educational system. (laughs) We should be learning these dynamics of relationship. Think about the amount of efficiency we could all gain, right? If we realize these types of things earlier in life. And, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, what is the mathematic equation? You know, what's a half of a half of a half? And I just say three divorces. 
Yeah. You know, relationships are interesting because they, they really like level the playing field because people can front and there's construction happening out front here. I apologize. Can you hear it? I can. Through? It sounds like a pretty awesome saw. Yeah, it's, it's going, <laughs> it's going down. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, the, so one thing, cause we have to wrap up soon cause you got to go in like 15 minutes. Uh, a question that I have for you that I feel like you'd be able to answer better than other people. And I don't know that I'm, uh, versed enough in the topic to even ask the question the best way possible. But what is underlying these seemingly enigmatic connections of things like the painting of the last supper or the painting in the Sistine chapel. And it's like the representation of a brain and like all these, like this, that sim and, and, and William Shakespeare and who like, who is Shakespeare? Like who the hell is Da Vinci in the first place? Like, where does he get all this information from? Like, it seems like perhaps everything could be in cahoots and there's some underlying consciousness or intelligence is that intelligence something that's more of like within the zeitgeist within the fabric is it an energetic thing that's kind of playing the pieces of humanity is it reptile people <laughs> is it like what the fuck is going on it's you okay it's your higher self it's all of our higher self the one divides itself in the many simply for the joy of becoming one again the dollar bill has e pluribus unum from many comes one right and and from the many returns to one. These omnia ab uno is the other way to say that in Latin. These representations are all pointing back to the fact that we have a you, you consciousness tore itself into two and then into four and then to eight and then to 16 and just kept tearing itself apart just for the pleasure and purpose of meeting you. Because eternity is a really long time without Netflix. So you're going to create a game where you can expand your consciousness, and maybe through our eyes, the universe also gains and expands. Maybe that's why it's expanding at the speed of light, which might actually just be our speed of perception, that each one of us is feeding an Akashic record because of our unique signature of information, our unique conditioning biases, our unique experiences throughout life led to us to see things in a different way, to add the number of facets in the universal pursuit of love, of learning. Is there some type of deep, from your perspective, some type of deep state, Bilderberg society, like some something going on in the background that has been this omnipotent, ever-present outside of like God, whatever God means to 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 you, uh, but actually human-driven or perhaps extraterrestrial-driven um, core of individuals that has been ever-present throughout history that is kind of pulling on the the tethers of 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 culture and society, and is perhaps some of this these enigmatic codes that we seem to be picking up throughout past paintings and uh, architectural structures and things of the sort. Um, has there been like a consistent consciousness that's driving the show of culture or is it kind of more dispersed than that? Or am I not intelligent? Enough I to think ask the right that question? Um, I think all of those things exist and where you place your attention right? Where your focus goes, energy flows. So as we as humanity start thinking about and conjuring up, you know, these secret societies that have negative nefarious intentions that will basically be overlords over us or reptiles underneath their rubber Mission Impossible skin suits, mm. right? Um, I believe fundamentally that it's all just consciousness and that there's nothing in the universe that is not God. But we need to understand that what we think of as God is not just some good guy. It's both. What we think of as God is a balanced masculine and feminine with equal darkness and equal light, that everything has its equal opposite reaction to every action, that, that what we think of as justice, right, um, and what must be done for the right isn't actually something that can be delineated or separated out from our own conditioning biases. What we tend to think of as what is ethical becomes what we believe will be most beneficial to us. And we see this all the time. I, I have negotiations all the time 
where someone is like trying to fight for something and claim that there was something wrong or bad or whatever, maybe illegal by another party until they figure out, okay, I'm just trying to do this so that I can get more. But they can't admit that because they can't see that. Why can't they see that? Because that's their dark aspect. So they convince themselves that doing it this way, which happens to benefit me, is the only right answer. That's why you have for thousands of years, you know, the shepherd in the Middle East who said, oh, you know, the sun has been really difficult on my hillside for grazing for my shepherd, you know, for my sheep. And the guy across the, the, the valley over there, he's in the shade. He's got greener grass and pastures than I do. Last night, my God appeared to me in a dream and told me I should kill him and consecrate his land to worshiping my God. That's the only ethical choice. And this is the story of humanity. We'll call that the chosen one, right? The chosen people or whatever. Chosen people are whoever believes that it will benefit them. <laughs> There's the chosen, right? That's the way it goes. The, the unchosen people never say, oh, we're not the chosen one. No, they just come up with a different God that says they're the chosen one, right? And that's the nature of how all of this actually works. So I do not believe, I, I feel first it's disempowering, and I believe that I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. So first and foremost, I refuse to accept a victim approach instead of actually looking within and saying, why did I choose this? Because yeah. I know I have a lot of control over my life. I have a lot of control over my experience. And extending that control to even include the things that I seemingly have no power over is ultimately an empowerment act. Yeah. Yeah. It's like having, uh, divorcing yourself or condemning some aspect of culture is kind of like a disassociation from self. Yes. You could say. And it's creating more separation. Yeah. There is no them. That's just a reflection of me. I, yeah. I'm a number. I have my own unique identifier. Sure. And then one over that number is my repetition cycle of life because that prime number, you take one over its value, will always have a repetitive cycle of numbers within it that creates a wave of experience. And then there also is value from a biological perspective to have a cell membrane and have boundaries. And Absolutely. But, it, but that doesn't mean that you need to have hatred for that which is outside of the cell. There could just be like, no, we'll just not allow this to penetrate this membrane. And I, I love you. I love you, but you're not yes, welcome in here. That's right. right that's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and the less attention I give you, the more likely you're just going to disappear. But it's, it's quite interesting because I, you know, we think about this separation construct and the more I separate myself from somebody else, right? It's okay to love and accept someone and say, you know what? I'm letting it go. Yeah. I'm letting it go. It's like, I, I love and accept you and I don't need to fight you anymore. You're not my I, enemy anymore. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not violently cutting the cord. I'm just easefully releasing. But Maybe there's a different energy. There's thing. such beauty in the realization that all the enemies that I accumulated, I mean, let's say that we, you and I, Aaron, were in the pre existence, right? There's a pre existence. Let's assume there's a pre existence. And I'm like, okay, here's my menu of all my stuff I'm going to choose. For all we know, we could be in some jello vat on Mars, right? Like in the future, laying in some jello vat with a headset on and thinking that that's all real. Could be. Sure. Right. Wouldn't it be trippy if all of a sudden, you know, SpaceX goes to Mars and the first thing they find is they stumble into a cave and then they see a placard that says SpaceX. It's so funny how I had to interrupt you because it's so funny how attunement works between people. Right. Just as you mentioned SpaceX, I was just in that moment thinking like, I kind of reminds me of Musk. I was like, I wonder <laughs> if he's ever connected with Musk. In that moment, you said SpaceX. In the beginning of this conversation, I listened to you know several of your interviews. Mm -hmm. I haven't really heard you talk about mushrooms. I'm sure you've talked about mushrooms. I it's haven't not, yet. I think this is the first place I've talked about it. It's, I not, think. it's not something that you're like, uh, like this super proponent of, I want to you know spread the gospel of mushrooms. <laughs> the very first, before this conversation, I was like, man, I'm... I'm kind of tripping on mushrooms right now. This would be interesting because it was like the because it was <laughs> there was a more a greater impact than I was anticipating this quote unquote microdose. And uh, the <laughs> first gut dang thing you talk about is mushrooms. And the first question you ask, I've never me talked is, about it before. Really, is hey Aaron, have you ever tried mushrooms? <laughs> like, <laughs> so You're what like, is that? Oh man. 
in. What is no, this fabric, th- this soup that we're floating in? We're all connected. And <laughs> it's like, Sorry I, for I, I, I call it love. <laughs> I call it love because love to me is metaphysical gravity. Love is the thing that we're here to learn that we don't fully understand that when we finally accumulate all of those facets, I just got this award. I'll show this to you. I just got this award from Cal State Fullerton. Mm. And it's interesting because it, it looks like this upside down diamond shape, right? It's kind of mm. a cool thing. It's got all these different facets on it. And it was a lifetime achievement award for like entrepreneurship and, and leadership and all this nice stuff. And so they asked me to give this speech. I was completely not ex- not ex- expecting it at all, right? Not at all. And first of all, the first thing he says, oh, we're going to give you this lifetime achievement award um, for all of your stuff. And I'm like, oh man, I got to drive to CVS and get some hair dye really fast. Because mm. like lifetime achievement award to me is like for old people. Mm. And and I was like, I'm not ready to be that guy yet, right? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm 54. I mean, I'm not 64 or 74. So So when he gave me this award... It made me think a lot because I was thinking at the same time about truth. And I was thinking my whole life has been about accumulation of these facts that actually I learned later were facets, that the black and white stuff was just shades of gray. And then when I realized that, then I thought, well, then what's the purpose of going through life to search for all this objective truth to only find out that there's no such thing? And the only thing that there is is the summation of all possible subjective perspectives. What's the reason behind it all? And that's when I realized that enlightenment is when the expression of love supersedes, it exceeds the desire for the objective truth. Hmm. And that was like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because then I was thinking, whoa, so the only thing that matters, I didn't say that love supersedes the truth, because ultimately the reason for all of this prism this entire prism with all of its multifarious facets is love itself. Hmm. That yeah, love that. is the reason we are here. It's the thing that connects the whole galaxy, the universe together. It's the fabric or the soup that you just asked about that connects for me to having never talked about mushrooms before to ask you on the day that you basically <laughs> took a, a decent <laughs> dose of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> right? That question. Or by the same token, the same thing where you were thinking about Elon Musk and I was talking about SpaceX. Yeah. We're all connected. It's only the illusion that we are not connected. And so the more that we judge other things, we create more and more separation from those things. And it's the same with the manifestation. If you want to manifest something, I, I, I know lots of people have great success by putting pictures on a vision board and stuff like that. I'm not that way. I like to just feel into already having that thing or having already achieved that thing yeah, and feel the gratitude and love for it. And that locks it in for me. Yeah. You had a good trick buying yourself the watch. Yeah. Buy myself a watch. I look at the time. I'd be like, Oh yeah, I already achieved that thing. I hadn't done yet. Hmm. I gave myself a gift in the future for having achieved that. And you know, that became a powerful totem for me. It's like that movie inception where they had little totems. They could wake up out of the dream. Right. Yeah. I was using watches as a totem to wake up out of the dream of the illusion of time. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we got We got to sadly wrap up. Hopefully, we'll do this again. And I, I want to get, get more into uh, some of the details of who's running this show, if there is a show, and if there's anyone even there running it in the first place. Um, can I just ask you, binary yes or no? Did extraterrestrial did extraterrestrials create the pyramids? Yes or no? Or is that too nuanced of a or would you need too much? I'll, I'll give you an answer. Okay. Um, there were extraterrestrials that came down from higher dimension. They are in, incarnated as humans on earth that built the pyramids. Mm. And they did that because they care about the future of humanity. They care about they the left universe, encryptions, the multiverse. They left encryptions just like I said about this. They left encryptions both for themselves and for humanity at large to make the transition over to where we're going to now, which is the Homo Sanctus Luminous. Mm. And that's doubling of the cube, doubling the octave of experience. So you could say that in the Bible, they're described as fallen angels. And they're the ones who gave us astrology, who gave us alchemy, 
who gave us the magic arts. They're the ones who gave us our numbering and measurement systems. They're the ones that throughout time have given us many, many things that all kind of stem back to Hermes Trismegistus. Yeah, Hermetic philosophy. Well, thank you so much, man. This is really fun. I enjoyed this. Thanks for calling Likewise. me out. Likewise. Thanks for calling me out on ODing on microdose mushrooms. <laughs> Next time I want to try it. <laughs> Next time I want to... <laughs> Just let me know, man. Let me into your party. What the hell? <laughs> uh, hopefully, we can do it in person. We'll do it we'll both. Uh, uh, yeah, see see what happens with that. Do, do you mi- microdose mushrooms? Is that a thing that you do? Do you macrodose? Is that? I, I mean, I sometimes I'll do a microdose, but usually it's kind of on the weekend type of thing. Yeah. You know? But but most of the time, I will. You know, sometimes I'll macrodose with like friends and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, depends on where I am and what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, I think mushrooms are like the best. Of all the drugs, that's the one that I, to me, is the. It should be the gateway. I think. I trust them emphatically. I think yes, that that's, me too. that's something. There's certain me things too. like like ketamine and and various different kind of um, more like synthetic substances mm-hmm. that seem like they have a lot of a lot of codes, quote unquote codes. Yeah. Yep. I don't I don't trust them emphatically. Likewise, I, I, I trust I trust biology very deeply. Likewise, and so, so to me, that's like the fungus. Like, hmm, there's something here. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, you have, so you, much. Yeah, you have. Um, so, wh- where should we point people? You have a book that just came out. Yes, you can go to. I have a new book called Neuro Mind. That's kind of like my non esoteric stuff. It's like what's happening with data right now. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm what's known as a polymath, and and so I have many, many wide variety of things. I have a book called Philomath as well. Neuro Mind is M I N E D, uh, and you can find it neuromind dot com. Uh, it's like how data is mined from us is the most valuable asset in the world today. Philomath is uh, the geometric unification of, of science and art through number and geometry. It's uh, it's it's a it's a very it's done very well. It's been the number one selling book in in number theory for the last two and a half years now on Amazon. Um, and then I have another book called Polymath. And then I have a number of courses you can find all my stuff on robertedwardgrant.com, my website, um, and also on Instagram, Robert Edward Grant, and and on YouTube. Yeah, and then I also have been binging on Code X on Gaia as well, which is a fun, fun wormhole to go down. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. Uh, I look forward to next time. Hopefully thank we'll do you, it in Aaron. Person and, Let's definitely uh, do it in person. Yeah, I like this idea. Uh, all, right. all right, that is it. That is all. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good one. Week. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. Por favor, tag us over on the Instagram. Uh, leave a little bit of a section of the podcast that you liked. I love resharing those guys. You can tag myself at Align Podcast, tag Robert Edward Grant at Robert Edward Grant. And also feel free to check the Align Podcast YouTube page out. We get instructional content each week as well as clips from this podcast. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for joining you. I'll see you next week.